G'day everyone and welcome to episode 661, the 12th of December 2019. How are you all? Uh, it just seems ages these days between uh, between podcasts, like we're just doing it once a fortnight now and Will and Jace stepping in on the other on the other week, as or the off week as I call it, which is good. So I hope you're all enjoying the, the different voices and whatnot. So hopefully it's bringing something new to the table. Uh, yes, I'm your host this week, Glenn Goodman. And uh, yeah, welcome to another episode of Aussie Tech Heads. We've got a few stories this week to get through. And uh, we, ha- we are, I've got to run through the... the the sponsorships first. Uh, we are brought to you by ATH Web Hosting. If you've got some hosting, you might have a website that maybe the, you might have a, a few kinks in it or things that you might not know what to do. Like, you know, you might not have an SSL certificate, keeps coming up unsecured or not secure in the browser. You go, look, I don't know what to do here. If I talk to a web person, it's going to cost me, a, you know, $300. Well, send me an email. I'll see if I can help you out. And, you know, of course, bring the hosting across to athwebhosting.com.au. Uh, SS draw, SSD drives, SSL certificates, Aussie support, me, and uh, domain registrations, and uh, a lot more. And also, we're brought to you by Start a New Company. Register your company with ASIC Online, Australia's easiest and fastest online company registration site. So once you register the, register the company, uh, we will send you, or well, Start a New Company, we'll send you the constitution, the ABN, the um, uh, the constitution and all the minutes of the meeting, etc. Uh, you can apply for an ABN and also trusts and self-managed super funds, stuff I don't know anything about, apparently are all coming very, very soon. Apparently like Christmassy time, so it might be a good Christmas present if you, I don't know, if you want to go and register a trust, get into it. All right, and we also brought to you by Aussie Bite Clock Faces in the Fitbit app gallery. Nice little weather clock face or whatever for your Fitbit. If you're into those sort of things, uh, go to Aussie Bite in the Fitbit app gallery. And if you check out with ATH19, you'll get 33% off that those uh, clock faces. All right. And before I, I'll go through the rest of the stuff further in the show, but let's get Big Joe on. How you going, Joe? Hey, Glenn. How you going? Good, thanks. Uh, what's been going on with you? Oh, mate, I've just been working on a few things of the computers over here the other last few days. Nice. Very good. Yeah, um, just fixing up a few computers and stuff, yeah. Well, like like old computers, your computers or customers' computers? No, no, just formatting hard drives, reinstalling OS, things like that. Right, okay. And it's all going good for you? Yeah, all good, yeah. Right. Do you use that uh, – are they they're your computers? No, one of them's a friend of mine and another one is uh, a friend of that person's. So they've had oh. problems with it. It wasn't working properly. So I, I said, okay, well, I'll blow the system away and I'll put it back on for you and you can go from there. So SSD drives while you're there? Yeah, SSD drive, yeah. Yeah, no, what, why I was asking for who they were, because I just remember that little program that, is it Nighty Night? That, you know, you can install, you just tick what you want to install and it'll just go away and just install everything for you. Oh, yeah, look, I'd forgotten all about that. But, yeah, no, I haven't used that one. Mm, it's, uh, it's not too bad. Um, all right, well, let's see what we're going to get into this week. Look, I've got a message, an email. Uh, through the week from Brett. Now Brett's 20k from Darwin, so he's right up there in the in the storms and the heat, and he's uh, he's got problems with MBN, same as a lot of people. So not only are so this is Brett. Not only are MBN missing people out, that they, they are now slowing people down. So I have been on a 50 20 plan, business plan, fixed wireless for about four years for the upload for about four years for the upload speed of 20. Now they have decided to remove it and change me to 25 down five up and graciously allowed me to keep paying the same amount. Well, that's what that's, that's been happening. Hasn't it? Like you, you pay the same amount, but your service has been reduced. Uh, it's not very good. I, I would be jumping up and down as well. Um, he goes on to say that he's been in the communication industry for about 30 years. They love how they, he loves how they try it. They try to spin it so it looks, you know, like it's the, his fault and not theirs that he he can't attain the, the good speeds. Uh, the solution appears to be reduce the speed of people rather than upgrade the infrastructure. Yep, that seems to be the the story, all right. And um, yes, so he's got some some issues up there. So hopefully by the time that you've you're hearing this, Brett, that it's all sorted itself out. Hopefully. Go, it was a hundred down and five up, and I remember five up was still very, very slow. Uh, still took me an hour to upload a YouTube, uh, this this podcast YouTube. It was an hour long, took me an hour to, or more to upload it. So, yeah, five up is not very good. So, hopefully, you can get your 20 back. Well, um, he's, he's getting a lot more than me because I'm only getting 1.5 up. So, got to be happy getting five. 
Oh, I guess so. So why, why haven't you switched over? I know, Joe, I think I've asked you this every time we talk about MBN, but why is it that you haven't switched to MBN? Well, no, because my, my cable internet is, is fine. You know, I mean, it works fine. I'm with Optus Cable and I do get down speeds of around about 90 plus. But um, the up speeds are, are fixed at around about you know, 1. 1.5, 1 to 1. 1.5, which hmm. sure, sure, it gets the job done, but, you know, it's not in line with everybody else. But if you went to MBN, you would get a better up. I would, but I wouldn't get a better down. You would, oh, but do you really, what, what do you think you would get for your down? Because I'm getting, I would do a speed test now and, and at regular, very regular intervals and, and, and more often than not, I would get at least 90 down and at least 30 up. All right. So what plan are you on though? Are you paying for that plan? Yep, yeah, the hundred, the hundred plan. I think they call it. So theoretically, a hundred down and forty up. Okay. And so I'm pretty good. It's it's pretty good over HFC, which I've got, and uh, I think that costs me about a hundred bucks a month. And um, yeah, it just just seems to be going. Okay, I'm not sure, but you're you're not, you're coming in. Um, there's no sound sometimes, Glenn. No, I, st I, st I still can't hear you. I don't know if it's an issue on my end or your end. Joe. Uh, Hello. Got you, yeah, I got you back now. All right, well, let's try that. Um, I'm not sure what happened then. I think something might have just changed settings mid mid flow. But anyway, yeah, I'm going to you do. A, you're back now. Well, I was going to do a speed test anyway. So let me have a look at my speed test. So this is with me streaming and saving and uploading and whatever. Uh, speed test dot net. Speed test dot net. Sorry, Brett. You'll uh, you'll be very uh, cranky. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let's, uh, let's, oh, how can I see that better? Let's see what we get here. Yeah, because your picture was a bit juddery as well, so maybe there is something going on. Oh, Joe, there might be. We're giving it a wrap and, oh, no, ping 21, here we go. Oh, no, that looks all right. Yeah, so that's pretty consistent, Joe. That's, what, 92. If I wasn't streaming like to you, uh, then it'd probably be about 95. Something like that. Okay, well, I'm just doing a speed test on my end. I mean, you know, you can't see my screen, but I'm getting ping of um, eight milliseconds. I'm getting 99, 100, 101, 102, hmm. uh, 103. Okay, max out at 103 down. Yeah. But you wouldn't, hang on, let me get rid of that speed test. But you wouldn't, take, but you would, wouldn't you rather say sacrifice, I don't know, say 10 meg from the top end of the down to get eight times more for the up yeah i guess um but uh, yeah so there we go it's given 1.5 1.6 up so it's not bad but i'm getting really low ping rates which is 0.8 so eight milliseconds hmm yeah ping is good yeah but that, that's because you're probably in sydney so that's all right that's pretty good all right now i don't know why i'm trying there we go i'm trying to switch to you and it's not working there is some something going on here this week it's just, uh, I don't know what it is. Let's just hope it, it's, all, it's all working. Okay. Uh, all right, where are we? Microsoft, let's get in, jump into a story. So, yeah, thanks, Brett. Thanks for your email and uh, bad luck. Merry Christmas also to you too. <laughs> Microsoft launches Teams for Linux. Now, this is just something I just want to pass by uh, because, like, I don't use Teams. I tried to use it, didn't like it too much. Uh, mainly because if you're involved in a few teams, you've got to keep logging in, logging out, logging in, logging out. Depends what team you want to get into. I think they might have changed it, but it's too late. I've moved on. Uh, but anyway, they've launched it for Linux. So a Microsoft blog announcing the release confirmed the long-rumoured debut of an Office app uh, for Linux. So it's the first Microsoft Office 365 app that is coming to the open source uh, Linux desktop. Uh, Microsoft has said that Teams on Linux will support all of Teams' core capabilities. 
And the reason why I just picked this story up is because I think it, it must go a certain way to show you that, that Microsoft must realise that there is life outside of Windows, you know, and uh, that maybe Windows, although it'll be around for a little while, uh, but, you know, there's more and more people that are, that are probably moving along to, to Linux and different sort of operating systems. Well, that's right. It's also teamed up with Android, hasn't it? Yeah, well, th this is true. And I think this is this is what's happening, isn't it? Like, I, I can't see, foresee a world without Windows, to be honest. I, I like it. Uh, as I was explaining to someone today, you know, like, yeah, Linux is there. Yes, it's free and everything. But there's a lot of other software. Now, I might be wrong here, but for example, say Photoshop that you can't get on the Linux machine. So you've got to go to Windows or Mac. So there's... A, Maybe the you know the uh, the third party commercial support isn't right there at the moment there for Linux, but, but I mean you know talk about servers and web hosting servers and everything. Geez, it's just Linux from wall to wall. It's just it's all over the show. But yeah, no, I just wanted to bring that up. That's all. That's that just a little quick one. And also another little quick one is the Mac Pro has arrived in Australia. Now this is this is I'm sure Joe you'll be wishing for one of these in the under the Christmas tree. Because Does it come with an Intel processor? It comes with the Intel Xeon W processor. Wow. Uh, turbo boost up to 4.4. Now, it only, it'll cost you 85000 You know, so just a, you probably might ask for two for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. A, like, it's a ma massive price. Uh, it's a 5 gigahertz, 28-core Intel Xeon W processor, 1.5 terabyte which is 12 times 128 gig of DDR4 memory, uh, two Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo, two times 32 gig HBM2 memory. Jeez, it's all too much. Four terabyte SSD storage. The Apple Afterburner card, stainless steel frame will be Magic Mouse, Magic Trackpad 2, Magic Keyboard with numeric keypad, uh, Final Cut Pro X and Logic Pro. Now, it looks like a cheese grater. Now, when you get it all, you think, oh, geez, that's uh, really, really, really expensive, isn't it? But uh, the, this yeah, model... 85 grand. Yeah, 85 grand. But, and you think, well, what, what, other, you know, what other computer would cost this much? Well, apparently, where I grabbed this story from, a place called crn.com.au, they actually they, they sat down and put those specs into a Dell, the Dell website to see how much it would come out to be if you were to get those sort of specs in a, in a Dell machine. Uh, they went on the Precision 7920 desktop workstation and it went past the 100,000 mark. So the Apple machine's a bargain. Get out there. Um, yeah, so uh, just so you can just spend so much money on them, can't you? The, the Apple Pro XDR monitor uh, will cost you 12 grand. So, um, yeah, look, look, I guess, look, if it works, it's a, it's a very, very powerful machine, I guess. And look, if you're a movie studio or something like that, this is just probably right up your alley. And this is just what, this is just what it costs to run movie studios and things That's like right. that. That's mm. right. Does it come with free iMovie as well? Uh, no, it's got the Final Cut Pro. Okay. iMovie might be a bit, uh, <laughs> a bit um, uh, consumery for it. Yeah. I think, yeah, so uh, the Final Cut Pro, X and the Logic Pro X it comes with. So it's a pretty good machine. Not bad, not bad at all. Uh, I'd like someone to do a, some benchmarking on something like that. Yeah, huge, huge. Um, all right, where, what have you got this week, Joe? Oh, look, I, I was um, looking and found this, uh, that Chrome now warns you when your password has been stolen. The new version um, of Google Chrome, version 79, it includes uh, a number of different password protection improvements. It has uh, things like um, warning you when your password has been stolen um, as part of a data breach from um, some sort of hack. Right. Yeah. Right. So that, that's wonder, a pretty cool feature to have. I remember, remember we always go on about that uh, website, Have I Been Pwned? Yeah. And I wonder if, and I know that that guy uh, wanted to retire it or wanted to sell it or whatever. I wonder now that, Google, that Chrome's got this, I wonder if somehow that Google, you know, bought him out or something. I don't know. It doesn't mention anything like that, but, yeah, it could well be something very similar mm. to that. 
or Google might have just made their own uh, um, investigative um, yeah, system. But that's a good idea. Keep going. I'll get up this yeah, well, phone well, and have well, a Apparently, Google's minute. also um, got a feature on their on their um, browser extension, which allows um, the people who are using passwords to know that they've you reused passwords for certain sites. So there is an extension, a browser extension, that checks for right. that sort of thing. So that you don't right. keep the same password on each site. Um, but what, they, what they're planning on doing is they're planning on actually putting that as a, a, a proper feature without having to use it as a browser extension. So they're going to be doing the uh, password protection and the uh, password uh, reused checkup feature. Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah, so what? that's what they're thinking about putting in this new version 79 of our Chrome. So with the password checker, though, I don't, I don't know. I, I have to make sure that was quite safe. That doesn't sound... I, I wonder if it sort of goes out to the internet to check or how does it know? So obviously then it's reading your passwords. What's in the back end of that little extension, I wonder? Well, that's um, true. I mean, it, it's like... Um, I, what does it say here? It... Um, it says that it's um, Google has improved its phishing protection with a, a real-time option, which allows Google uh, to use a list of phishing sites that update every 30 minutes. Oh wow! Yeah. So the company found that the fraudsters have been fraudsters have been uh, quickly switching domains or hiding around the Google crawlers. Mm. So what they've done is they've done this new real-time protection that should generate a warning for 30 percent more cases of phishing. Yeah. yeah to trying to get your password yes yes well what just come to mind while you were reading that uh while you're talking about that is that this is what why isn't edge doing this why isn't microsoft doing this but remember they had when the, when all the internet first came out like their internet explorer what 96 97 percent market share now it's what under 50 percent market share but well, this is the sort of stuff wouldn't you be thinking if you want market share back you've got to do this sort of stuff you've got to get people's interest and go Oh, Edge, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm better go back to that. Yeah, like, I, don't, I don't know. I think it's a bit too late. I think that ship sailed now. Um, yeah. they, they say never say never, but I think that ship sailed now when it comes to, you know, browsing and and in um, Google Chrome, I think is the king, the king of the crop. Yes, um, yeah, and I think, and just like before, you know, I think Microsoft sees their future probably off outside of windows even these days it's uh you know their future is the cloud who cares what you're using on your desktop to access the internet um doesn't matter their 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 future is in the cloud with azure and all that sort of stuff uh i've got that side up though joe have i been pwned yeah. and uh, it doesn't really say anything that if it's been you know scored by google or anything not that i can see anyway from a quick look but uh, look, for those that don't know what that does, you put your email address in and it'll tell you uh, what sites that your email address is with that have been had data breaches and so forth. So if I type yeah. in Glenn at Aussie, well, I, know, I, I know I'm involved. And then what you do is if you come up, if you have been pwned, then you just make sure you go back to these sites and uh, change your password. So, yeah, back in 2013, uh, I lost some of my data, email address, password, hints, passwords and usernames in an Adobe hack. There was, I must have signed up for some Apollo database. I don't even know what that is. Um, Bitly must have been hacked at some stage. Cafe Press this year, February 2019. Um, but, so when it was hacked, compromised my email address, names, password, phone numbers, physical addresses. Oh, that's no good physical address i don't know why online sites uh like oh, canva oh yeah oh, look at all the ones this year we've got canva collection one whatever that is daily motion dropbox so that was mid 2012 exploit in my fitness pal online plex oh the list goes oh, i've been phoned all over the show all right <laughs> yeah, so that's i might have to go back in and change all those yeah i might have to do something about it but yeah, i don't know why all these sites want your physical address Right. Well, see, I mean, that's the one there that you're talking about, have I been uh, phoned. I think that's more, is that more directly involved with just um, emails or is that all types yeah. of? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, this one here that Google's using is more directed towards just logins, different website logins. It's not directly involved with um, emails. So it's a right. slightly different thing. 
Mm. Well, I think like Google, the Chrome definitely seems to be leading the way, doesn't it? You know, advising sites that are not secure and all this sort of stuff. And uh, and people, the public, general public, I was talking to a lady today and I was talking to her about SSL tips and gets on. I said, you know what it looks like when your site's She goes, yes, I know. I've got one site right here. I'll show you. And she goes, yeah, it comes up not secure. And I said, that's exactly right. And she goes, I won't be putting any data into that site. And I said, congratulations. You exactly know what's going on. And that's just a lady that no, not, not, tech or anything it's in in the health foods and stuff so you know it was quite quite encouraging to see that that's right yeah i mean it's good people are starting to get the hang of things now and they're they're looking for that little lock that's um in the in the left hand corner of the website Hmm. yeah Yeah. that's right that's right um all right is that that one done well i just wanted to add this other little bit here that it talks about and it says that google is also improving um chrome's multi-profile support Mm -hmm. which um, allows people to use multiple profiles in Chrome and when you share them on different PCs. Right. So what it does is um, they're going to add the support for uh, a better visual indicator of what profile is currently being used. Right. So that way when you want to save passwords, you can save it to the correct profile. Like at the moment, you might find that if you're using, say, Joe the Gadgets Man at uh, gmail.com and I'm using my other email address, right, and you are got a particular login that you are in when it comes to Chrome and you go to save the password, it'll save it under that user, mm. right? Yes. What, Google, what Google is saying now is that they're giving you um, a particular op- options to be able to save it under different pro- uh, profiles. So if I'm under joethegadgetsman.com uh, dot, um, uh, at gmail.com, um, and I don't want to, and the site that I'm opening up is not a site that's affiliated or linked with that particular email address, and it's my actual personal email address. So I can opt to select select the password to save it to that site. Yeah, right. Well, that's pretty handy. I know because, as you know, I use the last pass. Uh, I've turned off the Google ones because they started clashing and giving me bad results. Uh, but that's that's a good idea. I think there should be more a, a better profile. Uh, indicator on Chrome. I think this is a, this is the reason why I think um, I, I stopped using LastPass. I, I found that although it worked a lot of the time, it didn't work all the time for me. Um, and in what way though? Well, let, let's say I wanted to use it on my phone, right? I, I I never left the option open to remember my password. Okay. Hmm. So um, when you're in LastPass. Uh, you have the option to tick the box that says, okay, I remember my password. So, um, and you don't have to keep logging in every time. So, yes, yeah. But, well, I find the last pass on the phone uh, not to be too bad. Oh, well, I've got the Apple iPhone, and yeah, it's not too bad. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. Yeah, um, yeah I've, well, I've just decided that's what I'm going to use. So, I've just got to make it work. I couldn't be bothered going through all the passwords or whatever again, teaching another new system. But yeah, but uh, but talking about Chrome and all things Google, uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin have stepped down from the uh, leadership roles at Alphabet, which is the the holding company of Google. So they're the founders, and they've stepped down. Uh, so that was quite interesting. Uh, I picked that up through the week. Uh, some guy called. Hang on, let me get this. What's his name? Uh, what's his name? Yeah, Sundar Pichai. Now he's going to be the new, the the new. What is he going to be? Uh, doesn't say what he's going to be. He's going to be the CEO. Yeah, uh, leadership rolls up into Google CEO. Well, he's not the CEO. He was the CEO. So his new. Oh, let me. Ju- I'll just read this, and it might come clear. Uh, so this guy, Sunday. Pichai, uh, he's 45, has been the CEO of Google since 2015 and a member of the company's board since 2017. He's previously served as, as Google Senior Vice President of Products from 2014 to 15, as Google Senior Vice President of Android, Chrome and Apps from 2013 to 2014. Prior to joining Google, Pichai worked in engineering and product management at Applied Materials, Inc., a semiconductor company and in management consulting at McKinsey & Company. So, um, yeah, it doesn't say what his role will be. Uh, we're planning to continue with Sunday uh, Wrigley. According to the Post, he's, he will be the executive responsible for accounting, 
are accountable for lending Google and managing Alphabet's investments in our portfolio. We are deeply committed to Alphabet, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't really say what the title is. Maybe he hasn't got a title yet. He's just uh, going to be the head cocky um, until he gets a title. That's probably how it's going to work. But yeah, so it was just something else that was interesting because what Larry Page and Sergey Brin, what they, that what Google, well, how old's Google? 20 years? 20 years old? Yeah, be close, yeah. How old is Google? Uh, 21, 4th of September, 1998. Yeah, so yeah, 20, 20 years they've been at the helm. Um, yeah, all right, lovely. What else you got, Joe? Well, if anyone that's got a BMW and one of those newer BMWs, hmm. um, BMW is finally adding, adding Android Auto to its informa informa information system. Oh, infotainment. Infotainment, that's, the word. that's, hmm. what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to say. Yes. Yeah. So um, from next summer, uh, you'll be finally able to cast your phone to uh, a BMW. The new BMW revealed that it is going to add Android Auto to support its iDrive 7 infotainment system as nice. of next year. The company did say at the same time that it's abandoning its controversial decision to charge an annual fee for anyone that's using Apple CarPlay. Oh. Um, uh, so if you're using the Apple CarPlay, CarPlay feature to cast your, your iOS device, they can abandon any of those fees that they were going to charge. Yeah, so they should. That's, um, that's pretty rude, isn't it? Charging to use it. Yeah, Very but I, this is what I like to know, and I haven't sort of worked it out yet. You hop into a car, and it could be any type of car. It could be a rental car, or it could be a new car, and it's automatically got internet access, and it's got GPS access, and you just drive it, and you just use it. Now, how does that work? It must well GPS, maybe from the GPS. I don't know about internet. It yes, I don't know. It'd have to. It wouldn't have internet. At, just jumping into it, surely, unless you're in it with the car well, salesman. The Google Maps part of it does. Right, yes. Yes. I mean, I've seen some cars now that have had that, and um, I asked the owner, do you pay anything extra for that? And he goes, no, it's just there. Yeah, right. Maybe that's why they wanted, maybe they, that's why they wanted to get paid to use the Apple, or, you know, charge for Apple Pay. Maybe it is an inbuilt thing where they must have a, an internet connection to whoever say Telstra and BMW picked that up, picked up the tab just for uh, for the for, for, um, map data or something. Yeah, look, uh, look, that's interesting. If any of the listeners know how that part of it works, if you can send a mail in or uh, to the Aussie Tech Eds to find out um, how that works, because it'd be interesting for me to know. Mm. We well, can send that to Joe Orglin at AussieTechEds.com.au and we'll be very interested to find out what, what happens there. Very interesting, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is, and apparently there's none. The you know, as of iOS, uh, iDrive seven, uh, there's no need to use a USB cable. Um, right. But the, there are some wireless support to a selected number of Google and Samsung devices with this uh, new Android um, for this right. uh, BMW. Yeah, nice, nice. Uh, the the good thing about it as well, which they mention here, is that you'll be delighted to know that if you are able to integrate your phone into the BMW inf information system. Um, it'll allow the Android Auto to display in the car's main display, right. as well as the uh, instrument oh. panel, and as well as the heads up display that you get on the windscreen. Mm. Yeah, so you get them, it actually works all over the place. So they're sort of re really integrating the whole system into that Android Auto. Mm. Yeah, well, that, that sounds good because like uh, my mum just got a say third party, you know, touch screen thing put into a Mazda, and so ripped out the old wasn't touch screen, I'm just some old CD interface that she had. She put this new thing in, and uh, yeah, some of the inbuilt dash things on the Mazda not working as how they should now because uh, I had to disconnect things just to put this screen That's thing right. on. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when I put mine in my car, when I got an Alpha One Five Nine. Um, and that had an inbuilt um, display system, you know, in, in the dash and stuff. And when I replaced the original radio in there, um, I lost access to different type of um, features that are on the screen, like the, what songs playing would play up, would mm. normally come up on the display, and in, you know, just in front of the steering wheel and, and things of that nature. I lost all that. So mm. I really think it's really good that BMW is integrating the whole thing 
into the into the system. Yeah, but when you say you lost it, you would have lost it on the dash, but it would have come up on the screen that you've just put in. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. if you wanted yep. it to. Yeah, yeah, yep. that's right. Yeah, all right. Uh, now, as we were saying, yeah, send Joe or I an email. Uh, you can also catch us on the Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds and youtube.com forward slash Aussie Tech Eds. Uh, it's the Aussie Tech Radio.com, uh, which is a uh, wall to wall tech podcast from Australia. So you can tune into that, go to Tune In Radio, or you can go to AussieTechRadio.com and figure out uh, and learn how to use it all. But uh, yeah, it's just 24 7 back to back. New shows are on every Friday. Uh, might be a bit light over the Christmas break on new shows. There's a lot of shows like ours that are going to, uh, uh, you know, have a bit of a break. But, uh, but you know, let's just see. Well, if, if the shows are there, I'll put them up and we'll see what happens. Uh, I've been, look, sometimes they're. Some of the weeks have been a bit slack with, with shows. So look, I might have, I, I looked up the, you know, Leo's, the Twit Network, and their shows were creative commons. As long as I didn't pull them apart, so I just whipped a couple of those in. And, uh, yeah, Bob's your uncle. But, yeah, our uh, website is at aussietechheads.com.au forward slash podcast. And, uh, yeah, get stuck in. Now, what, where was I up to? Uh, yeah, so talking about your BMWs, I've got a car story as well. Now, the Tesla Model 3 on autopilot crashes into a police car. Oh, right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like another little thing. Like, I mean, are these cars really, you know, like, yeah, you know, they've got these ones driving around Sydney, you know, in test tracks or Adelaide or if they are just drive buses, auto buses driving around. Like, are we, are we really ready for this at the moment? Uh, a, Tesla, a Tesla has crashed into a police car while on autopilot in the US. Both the police car and the other vehicle, which had broken down, were stationary at the time of the incident, the driver told police that he put his Tesla Model 3 on autopilot so that he could check on his dog <laughs> in the back. Oh, so, really? uh, yeah, not good, not good. Uh, so but then again, if you're, if you're going to put your car on autopilot, it doesn't matter what you do, it should actually be, you know, working properly. Exactly. If, if it does mean, you know, you want to check on your dog at the back or you want to look outside the back, win uh, outside the back window or on the side, it should, it should actually work, you know what I mean? Yes, like, I'm not sure it doesn't. This article doesn't go into what had happened, but the more importantly, why I pulled this article to talk about was uh, it was on autopilot, and th this is all the buzz, you know, as I was saying, they've, they've got these cars in tests everywhere. Oh, this is the future, this is the future. And as I've always said, I'm worried about it. I don't, I don't think they're ready. Anyway, so the driver was charged with reckless uh, driving and reckless endangerment. So this is not the first time a, te a Tesla has crashed while on autopilot. In total, they have been at least five fat fatalities worldwide while they've, someone, they've switched on autopilot and they've gone off and done their own thing. Uh, now, the, this is in the US, okay? So the National Transportation Safety Board are currently investigating accidents caused by the, this autopilot. And Tesla, and this is more, more interesting, Tesla did not immediately respond to a request for comment. However, they said the firm does not recommend that drivers remove their hands from the wheel while using autopilot. Why, why is it there? What's so auto about it then? Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. It's a nasty crash by the look of it. Mm. The front end's wrecked. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I don't know, are we ready for this sort of stuff? I'd like to know I mean, go deeper into that. Maybe we're not ready just yet, but I'm, I'm sure that it will, uh, it will happen in the future. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure it'll happen and, and when it does. But I just think, oh, I guess like everything, well, there's another picture. I'll show you this picture head on. If you're on the YouTube, you'll be able to see some of these. Look at that. That's a, that's a bit of a crash. Mm. Actually, this story goes on underneath that. Um, the police force added, regardless of your vehicle's capabilities, while operating a, a vehicle, your full attention is required. Uh, this is not, oh, yes, I got all that. Yeah, right. I'd like to know, yeah, why it crashed. What what went wrong? Maybe it must be a sensor or something went wrong. Who knows? But anyway, that's that. Um, yeah, and what else, Joe? Well, I was looking, um, and uh, if you have an iPhone, there's an iOS bug in the AirDrop feature that lets anyone temporarily lock you out of um, a phone that's nearby that's also another Apple phone. Right. Um, yeah, so... Apparently, Apple has fixed a bug in iOS 13.3, which is out today, um, yes. which lets anyone temporarily lock users out of their iPhones and iPads as well by forcing them uh, by forcing their devices into an in in inescapable loop. Now, you'll be able to see what I mean by this if you look at the show notes. 
there is a video on one of the links there to show you how that works. Uh, but what was happening really is that uh, a bug in AirDrop allows users to share files between iOS devices, but the bug also uh, repeatedly sends files to all devices able to accept the files uh, within the range of, of the attacker. Mm. So when a file is received, um, the iOS blocks the display until the file is accepted or rejected. But because iOS didn't limit the number of file requests um, that a device can accept, an attacker can simply keep sending files and files again and again, repeatedly uh, displaying um, the file uh, accept box on the other device, which causes the device to get stuck in a loop. It's mm -hmm. a bit like uh, a denial of service attack, you know, which yeah. locks someone out of their phone, if you know what I mean. Yeah, like we, yeah, so it's like, uh, so while you were talking about that, I'm thinking it's not really, like the, the person doing this is not getting anything out of it apart from a kick, really. Basically, like, yeah. So well, there's, if, if somebody wants to send one or two uh, files over the airdrop system, they can, that'll work okay. But if somebody wants to play games with you or lock you out of your device, um, if you haven't got you know, the most recent update, they just keep sending files to you and um, it'll just lock you out of your device. You won't better get into it. Mm. Well, I'm sure this was happening at schools around the country. <laughs> I'm sure kids were having fun with it. <laughs> well, look, look um, devices that are normally uh, open to receive files from anyone are the ones that are at risk, really. Um, you can simply just turn off your Bluetooth um, and that sort of stops people from sending you files. But, yeah. but what you should know is that once you've got that file sent to you and you're in a loop, you just can't turn off the Bluetooth. They won't allow you. Right. So, so what you need to really do is um, you'll need to actually move away from all devices which could possibly be sending you, you know, uh, these sort of files that are keeping you in the mm -hmm. loop. So, you know, I'd say walk away 15, 20, 30 metres away from, from any other device in the middle of the street even, down the road. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, once you're away, if you do get stuck in, into this into this infinite, uh, infinite loop, once you're away, um, you can then turn off your, your Bluetooth and then you'll be fine. Yeah, and then update. And then update, exactly. <laughs> yes, I updated mine today. I heard about this and, uh, and I went, oh, an update. And so I went in and went, oh, yeah, there is an update. I better, I'll do that. I'm, I'm pretty good at doing updates on the iPhone. I'm not, not, not uh, um, uh, what's the word? I don't know. I'm not scared of them. You know, some updates for certain things, you think, oh, you know, should I do it, you know, on the day of release? But, yeah, Apple ones are all right. Yeah, so but if you're listening to the podcast and you think and you use the AirDrop feature a lot and uh, you do have it set so that you can receive files from anyone, Perhaps turn it off until you do an update. And then once you do the update, you can turn it back on and it should be fine. What, what the update will do is it, it stops. Um, Apple, Apple has fixed the bug by uh, adding a, a rate limit so that it doesn't continually uh, mm. send files. So it might, I don't know. It doesn't say here how, many, how much uh, files it allows, but it mm. says here that it's fixed the bug by adding a rate limit that prevents the barrage of requests over a short period of time. I reckon you can still have fun with it, even if it's a five file limit. You know, I think kids, you, I think kids will still have fun with that. Now, look, well, moving on to uh, someone that's not going to see 2020 is George Laura. Now, you, does that name ring a bell with you, uh, Joe, or anybody? Probably not. But I'll tell you who George Laura is, uh, and I'll tell you why we're talking about him because unfortunately he died. He was 94. Uh, but he was the co-inventor of the barcode. So we all know the barcode We've, on every product that we buy. There, you know, there it is. So it was while working as an electrical engineer with IBM that George Laura, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, L-A-U-R-E-R, -E -R, we'll call it that, that George fully developed the universal code, the UPC or the barcode. He developed a scanner that could read codes digitally. He asked, use he also used stripes rather than circles that were not practical to print. So in the early, I'll get a picture of uh, old Georgie boy, old George, that's in his, looks like in the 70s, in the good old days. 
Uh, the, the, in the early 70s, grocery shops faced mounting costs and the labour-intensive need to put price tags on everything. The, his UPC system used lasers and computers to quickly process items by scanning. Uh, this meant fewer pricing errors and easier accounting. The first produced, the first product scanned was in Ohio in June 1974 with a packet of Wrigley's Juicy Fruit Chewing Gum. Now, surprisingly, the chewing gum still exists and it is on display at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History in Washington. Um, now, I guess it's this chewing gum. I think that's how the sentence reads. Well, I read that a few times. I'm thinking, is it the chewing gum that's on display or is it the scanner? I'm thinking, chewing gum? What, from 1974? <laughs> I wonder if it's still got its flavour. Uh, fellow IBM employee Norman Woodland, who died in 2012, is considered to be the pioneer of the barcode idea, uh, which he initially based on the Morse code. Although he patented the concept in the 1950s, it's amazing how old some of, you know, the the age where this the technology, some of this sort of actually started. Like in the 1950s, now uh, he was, I mean, this is like, you know, probably what before, punch card machines or something and this guy's figuring out barcodes uh, so uh, although he patented the concept in 1950s he was unable to develop it it would take a few more years for laura to bring the idea to fruition with the help of low cost laser and computing technology so there he, there he is poor old george look here's a picture of a barcode just in case anyone out there doesn't know what we're talking about oh look it's a video let's play it and see what happens what happens in this video you know let me get rid of the sound. The sound will probably come on. Oh, that's an ad. Don't you hate these 15 second ads? You have it's to like advertise in 24 seconds. Try, oh, you have to get YouTube Premium and get away from those 15 second ads. I don't know if they do anything about the normal ads. Hang on, we're going to skip it in a minute. There we go, skip. Let's see what this, what this barcode thing was all about. But yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, it's amazing how, like, 1950, this, the idea was, Correct, well, invented and yeah, it took a few years for it to happen, and now it's just mainstream everywhere you go. Barcodes, barcodes, barcodes. Yeah, so all good, jo uh, Joe. Old George, poor old George, won't see next year. But anyway, that's what happens when you get the 94, I suppose. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what else, Joe? You must be nearly out of stories. You've had a busy week. I've got a couple more. Um... I don't know if the listeners remember, but a couple of weeks ago I talked about the new um, privacy uh, and penalties uh, for censorship for um, the digital platforms that are coming out at the moment. Well, Australia's now come out, come out with their own version of it. Oh, good. Yeah. And apparently they're, they're going to be stricter on uh, pay and subscription television, uh, mm -hmm. terrestrial TV, Netflix and other demand services. Uh, you know, that come from you know, the likes of Apple and Google. Um, they all have different ways of, of uh, grading content and stuff, but the government's having uh, opted for a self-regulated regulated approach. Um, hasn't sort of worked very well. Mm. So what they've done is that they've targeted different codes. The government says that social media services such as Facebook, Instagram and Twitter uh, instant messages services such as Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, Viber, and some interactive online games and websites and apps, um, and even some service providers among others. Um, there's a there's a code coming out now um, that's been introduced in 2000 early 2019 um, of the Criminal Code Amendment Act. Right, and. Um, which applies to content service providers and the hosts of those providers mm. um, to block um, such content which they call, um, which which can be called upon by the federal government, federal police uh, to be able to do that for them. Yeah, well, like looking at, uh, look, I was just reading some of those notes you had there and, um, yeah, with the part where it says can they uh, compel the, this act's going to compel ISPs and hosting providers to to block such content if called upon to do so by the AFP. Like, who who's going to who's going to say no? I'm not doing it. Like, what? <laughs> Just say no, no AFP. I'm not going to block that. Go away. Like, if you're requested by the police to do something, you would do it, wouldn't you? 
Well, you would hope so. You have well, to. I mean, that's that's what they're doing now. now. I mean, they're making it law. Mm. And they're talking about serious, uh, you know, there's two types of way, uh, cl- categories. They're talking about class one and class two. And class one um, is uh, seriously harmful content, which includes things like underage, uh, which is illegal under the AM Commonwealth Criminal Act, such as child sexual abuse material, um, ad- uh, horrid uh, violent material, uh, and content that promotes, incites, or instructs uh, instructs it in a serious crime. Um, so they, 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 if they find that there's people who are promoting it uh, or showing it or anything like that, the federal police can then go ahead and tell the service provider or the companies like Google or Facebook to go ahead and block it. You know, whether they want to or not, they have to now, apparently, according to this law. But that's crazy, though. Like, because well, like, I know in, the, say, in my terms and conditions and most terms and conditions for hosting, like, it says if you're, if you're going to put child sec- sexual abuse or, you know, unsocial, like, unsocially accepted material up there, well, we have the, res- we hold the, have the, reserve the right to shut you down. Like, geez, like, well, that's right. I mean, but I think what they're trying to do is they, 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 they might shut you down, but I think they're trying to, in this case, is just trying to stop certain type of um, content from being displayed rather than mm. shutting things down. It probably just makes it quicker, I guess, like if it's, if it's a law. Well, well at, the, just... at, the moment, at the moment, apparently there's, um, there's, there's an automatic or a, what would you call it, like a, it's an automatic system. There's nothing actually being monitored or anything like that that does it. It's mm. like a, okay. Self-regulated. Yeah, that's the word I'm looking for. It's self-regulated. So um, they might imp- apply a few filters, and if content of that nature comes along, then it gets blocked. Mm. Um, but what, what they're saying here is that uh, the Australian Federal Police are, are also able to now instruct various providers uh, and, and content providers to do certain things now. But would you be more concerned with class two content? Uh, no, will be class two content. The class two content is what? Uh, the will be defined as content that would be otherwise classified as RC, whatever that meant. But it was X eighteen plus R eighteen plus and MA fifteen plus. Uh, so that include high impact material like sex, sexually explicit, high impact, realistically stimulated, probably simulated, violent content. So. Um, I, I mean, like, I, I, I hear that as perhaps some sort of gaming content. Yeah, uh, but I'm looking at that and thinking, okay, are they saying that, say, you know, so they go to Telstra and they say, okay, uh, Pornhub, knock it off. Don't, don't, don't let any of Telstra customers have access to it. Uh, but maybe not, maybe that might be about it, maybe not as good as the example because that is a, that's a porn site, but maybe something MA15+. plus. Maybe that could just be a movie, a real, a pretty violent movie. Like we've all seen movies that are MA15+. plus. Uh, are they saying that, okay, Netflix, get rid of that movie. Don't stream well, that that's movie. Right. That, that's like, right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So this could get pretty – That like the class two might be a bit more worrying. Like class one, like uh, child sex abuse, abhorrent violent material, no-brainer. But class two could be a bit of a worry. Yeah, you know, they even like, talk about coarse language um, mm. or less epicked violence. Um, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I know, like, you know, the, the bad language is around everywhere. Well, if I remember growing up, the you know, the, the, you wouldn't hear that sort of language on TV, but now you hear it all over the show. <laughs> it doesn't well, really right. matter, does it? Yeah. Um, Look, I, I, the, it's good and bad. I mean, you know, sometimes people do talk bad language, but it's not – directed at anyone in particular it's just mm. a, a, a habit of saying if you know what i mean it's not like directly uh, offending anybody but mm. some people say that you shouldn't still do that anyway yeah yeah well that's right but who's the name because what because my next one when you have you finished with that one yep yep yeah because my next one my story here is maybe this game could be considered one of them <laughs> the, uh, the game which has caused controversy is called i am jesus christ now, it's, of course, a stir. Anything to do with religion, obviously, causes a stir pretty much straight away. So a trailer for I Am Jesus Christ has been grabbing plenty of attention. It's been published uh, to YouTube by the developers called Playway, who are Polish. The trailer indicates that I Am Jesus Christ includes miracle working, crucifixion and resurrection storylines. I thought that was, um, I don't know, somewhat okay. <laughs> Like as long as it's okay, I don't think it's too blasphemous, is it? 
That's all right, isn't it? I think there's a bit of a game about, you know, you might be Jesus walking around. I, think, I don't know. I'd have to consult the Bible to see how. I find that a bit offending. Oh, I don't know. Do you reckon? Is it blasphemous to do that? Must be. But anyway, uh, the trailer has been viewed more than 330,000 times. So, yeah, blah, blah. And then who's this? Uh, I Am Jesus Christ is a realistic simulator game inspired by stories from the New Testament. Explains uh, this distribution site theme. Uh, check if you can perform... <laughs> Check if you can perform all famous miracles from the Bible, like Jesus Christ. It is a simulation game and you try to save the world as he did. Are you ready to fight with Satan in the desert, exercising demons and curing sick people, or calm the storm in the sea? This game might be for you. Uh, no details of the game's release date yet have been posted, although the description on Steam says that it's coming soon. Well, it's been uh, a raucous created. I'm sure the game's going to be immensely popular now. But, uh, yeah, I was going to say, you could, you could rather than using the name Jesus Christ, you could use anything and anybody else in that particular game and mm. it wouldn't, wouldn't be offensive. I think the, the name, you know, calling it Jesus Christ and, and the way they go about it, some people will, will find that offensive. Well, I, would, I would look at it and, you know, I would look at it and maybe say to the people who are offended by it, say, well, maybe this is just a, a modern way of introducing people to the Bible. You know, because, okay, so young kids are going to get in there and, and they're going to learn about parting seas and, and doing miracles and all this sort of stuff, whereas they might not <laughs> learn that anywhere else. And then as they grow up, they'll go, oh, Jesus did all that. And they know all about it. That's the game because they played the game. I don't know. That's my thought. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Fighting the devil. Who doesn't want to fight the devil? Um, all right, Joe, any more? No, that's all I've got this week. All right. Well, that's about all we have got all up. But just before we go, I thought we'd give you a quick This Day in Tech history just so we can uh, see what's gone on this day before us. Now, in talking about Chrome, uh, Joe, 2008, December 11, Google Chrome released the first stable public version. So that's, uh, what, 11 years old? I uh, just turned 11. So that's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Now, back in December 10, 1993, uh, Doom was released. Oh, hey, how good was Doom? Uh, what did you say? Awful. Doom, Doom, Doom. Yeah. Did you like Doom? Did you play it? Oh, I didn't play. I don't. I'm not, a, I'm not a gamer, so I didn't play games. But I remember watching my kids play it. Yeah. Yeah, I played it when I was younger. Uh, now, December 9, 1987. Throw a dart at this one. Windows Two is released oh look at look at that operating system <laughs> you know what i've still got some 3.5 floppy disks somewhere with windows 1 1 or something like that somewhere I, oh I, my god I, yeah i've got them somewhere Are they, what the five and a quarter floppies it's three and a half floppies no it must be window i reckon that's windows 3.11 3.11 okay i knew it was something like that i've got some of those floating around somewhere i don't know whether i haven't seen them for a while they're in a box somewhere yeah, yeah, God, I think because you had your five and a quarters before your three and a halves and five and a quarters are out. Yeah, well, I reckon it'd be them. But anyway, uh, Douglas. Talk, Engel- sorry, talk about five and a quarters. If anyone wants a five and a quarter drive, I've got a box full of them. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say a box, but I've got about five or ten of them. Well, the next question to, for me would be, have you got the, the cables? The floppy uh, cables. I do have the ribbon cables. Not brand new, but I got them second-hand ones. And and then my next question would be, <laughs> it's got a board that's got the floppy things in it. Well, the no. The controller. I mean, all the modern boards wouldn't have them, but no. if someone's building up an old machine and they need a, uh, a, a five-and-a-quarter drive. <laughs> but you, you don't care who's got the board, Jay. you just got the drives. And the, I've got a few drives. Your... I mean, I, I remember, and I'm talking about about five, six years ago, I remember – getting on eBay and and, uh, and someone was selling uh, these drives and I don't remember how much I paid for them now. It would have been somewhere within 20 or $30 for these five or six drives. And I thought, you know what? And and back then it was just the drives were just starting to come out, right? They weren't getting mm. used anymore. And, and I was still using one of them at the time. And I thought, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy these and save and put them away. Yeah, nice. <laughs> right. Now I'll tell you, you, what, you might have floppy drives. Hang on, can I reach my box here. Hang on. Oh, I'm not down to reach it. It's not full. 
That's quite heavy. It hasn't got beer in it. That's it's got bloody CD ROM drives. Oh wow! I've got a few of those as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I've just they're in a box because I've I've just decided which ones worked and which ones didn't, and uh, I'm just going to put them up on Gumtree or something. I've got a whole heap of IDE drives, and I'm talking twenty. 20 uh, gigs and, and 40 gigs and stuff, but old IDE drives. And I don't know what to do with them. I, I'm, I don't know. Them. Well, I'll tell you actually, because I, I, I figured this out after I destroyed, oh, I don't know, 20 of my old hard drives. And I thought, would it, because I remembered that, you know, this is how the, uh, how the, these drive uh, data recovery people work you know they they use the circuit boards from old drives because most of the time it's the circuit board that goes they replace the circuit board and then bam oh you know the drive spins back up uh so so look i had a couple of drives and i destroyed them and then i thought i wonder if they were worth anything <laughs> so i jumped on ebay and look most of them i could have probably they're on ebay for 20 bucks uh whether or not you you know, you find a buyer, but they were on eBay for twenty bucks, so you could be lucky, Joe. Um, well, I've, I've got a, I've got a two fifty IDE drive, um, still in the package sealed, brand right. bigger. Oh, look, chuck it up on an eBay or write to some drive recovery people. Yeah. Might, you know, you might and get twenty a, bucks. And uh, I remember back then, um, I, I, my very first home server was a. Uh, what they call a yellow server, yellow box server. I'm not sure, sure if you remember the type of ones they're talking about. No. And it's a it's an it's a four bay in one system that ran the very very first version of Windows Server, I believe. Right. Wow. Yeah, and that's and that, and that was one of my first servers. And and when I bought it, um, it, it came along with some drives, and then one of the drives died and I went online looking for some um, other drives and I found another person um, who's selling the whole box of spare parts and everything with that drive. I thought, yeah, I'll grab that. Wow. Yes. And um, actually, it, if I, I remember now, that it was actually the person who sold it to me the first time. He had a business selling them here in Australia and I ended up buying it off him. <laughs> and, yeah, and in right. that box, alongside it, came a, a brand new drive still sealed of um, a 250 gig. Yeah, right, right. Well, you know, yeah, oh, I think after I realised that they were worth $20, the only way I could console myself was pretty much, well, it would take me more than $20 worth of time and effort to, to wipe them to my satisfaction. So uh, <laughs> that's how I consoled myself. But, yeah, I don't have any draw. I've got a few little three and a, uh, two and a quarters, whatever the hell they are, little laptop drives up there that I have a look at and, I might punch in the serial number see if they're going for anything. Uh, I, I got myself one of these just recently. Um, I'll show you. I'm not sure if you can see it. One of these. Oh, it's like a little toaster. Right. And it's yeah. got all the different drive things in it. Well, uh, IDE as well. Yes, IDE as well. Wow. Right. What's the, so what's it's, it's, and, and this thing here allows you it's, – it's got all the different drives in the front or the memory card drives. And on the back, it's got uh, USB, your, your power supply, your 12-volt power supply. And and it's got like a, a little push-button system right in the front here that lets, allows you to copy drives. Oh, nice. Right? Nice. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's quite a multi-function hard disk drive docking system. I did notice, though, Joe, it's only USB 2. Yes, it is, it is USB too. But hey, you know, um, if you're nothing. using an old IDE drive and you want to transfer stuff over to a USB, or if you've got mm. a USB um, thumbnail, uh, thumb drive and you want to transfer something to a hard drive, or even to one of the memory cards in the front. Yes. Got the memory slots in the front. Yeah, yeah, nice. It's really cool device. Where did you get that from? Well, I got it from, I think it was wish.com. Oh, yes. Com. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good. Good score. How much? Uh, I think I paid somewhere forty nine dollars something like that for this one. That's there was all right. A, there's two types of there. There's a cheaper one which is about thirty bucks, and there's this one here which is a bit more. I went for this one here because I wanted to. I wanted the IDE drive. Yeah. Right. Well, so I can you? go through my old drives and see if there's anything on there that I want, hmm. and then get rid of them. Otherwise, I've got to boot up and install Windows and all that sort of stuff. So this is another way of doing it. Well, that's how I went through my drives. I've got the, the computer 
you can't see it. There's this one behind me that's open. I just plug the drive in, boot her up, see what's on it. No, nothing. Okay. You know, turn it off, unplug, put another one in, boot her up. But yeah, so I'm finally getting rid of all my stuff. But, but you know, like, it's like you think like today, like 30 years later, you think, oh, I wish I hadn't got rid of my little Apple IIc. It'd be quite cool to have now. But then at the time, you just go, well, it's just a piece of junk. <laughs> just hanging around. I've got to get rid of it. I think I got two hundred for it, but now it's probably worth a little bit more. And um, yeah, I, but what do you do? You can't keep stuff your whole life. Well, that's right. I mean, I got rid of an old IBM computers. You know, those old IBM computers, original oh, ones. The XTs. Yeah, the really yeah. early model ones. I got thinking no, that uh, what's this shit? You know, who's who's no. going to want this anymore? Yeah, I had a couple of those. I was heavy as anything. And uh, yeah, but that was a, a, a twenty meg hard drive that used to weigh as much as. Two reams of paper. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, just <laughs> crazy. All right, Joe. We better get out of it. We talk like this all, all night. We could, couldn't we? Yeah. So this could be Joe our last show for the year because, as you know, Jason will be stepping in next week, which will be the last week before Christmas. So, uh, so if they're here next week, there's no reason why they're not. But if, if, if they're here, if they're not here, well, we'll be here. But uh, but in case they in case they are here. We'll wish you all a Merry Christmas. How, how was that for something complicated, something easy made complicated? Um, so, yeah, have a good Christmas, Joe, and a good New Year. We, we shall return early in the New Year. We're not going to go over Christmas. We'll just have a break and uh, come back maybe the 9th or the 16th of January, unless by popular demand we get in on David. <laughs> no. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Uh, yeah. Have a Merry Christmas to you too and to our listeners as well. Have a, a, a Merry Christmas and a safe New Year. Mm. Yes. Yeah, hope to see you next year. Yes, for sure. So, yeah, be, be merry and be careful. So uh, all the best, everyone. Hope next year is a, a, a very prosperous and happy new year for you. So uh, until then, all the best. Take care and happy new year. Bye for now. Merry Christmas.